かな。Let's start our CMSA colloquium. Today, we're very lucky to have our grapple as our speaker. So, leads the research group will be and hold the chair of engineering at University College London. Torres studied physics at the University of Hamburg, Imperial College London, and Technically University of Berlin, where he also obtained his PhD in machine learning. After working for Microsoft Research in Cambridge, a deep mind tour devotes his efforts to understanding and creating intelligent systems. And today he will discuss some of the results of his work. Tore, thank you for joining us today. Please take it away. Great. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope everyone can hear me all right and that the sound quality is good. Uh, I wished I could uh, be there in person. Um, that would be much more fun, um, but I think uh, we've by now all gotten used to the uh, convenience of the remote seminars. So um, uh, I hope we'll have a good hour. So I certainly think I have an interesting story to tell from AlphaGo to Mu0. Um, you've probably heard about AlphaGo uh, a few years back, the program that was the first to beat a professional Go player at the game of Go. And we've since then made some great progress in generalizing the methodology and the latest algorithm um, that we've developed, um, I refer to as Mu0 here, um, will be uh, the, the topic of the talk, but I'll tell the story of how, how we got there. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that this is um, in collaboration with many amazing people. And in particular, I would like to highlight uh, Julian Schrittwieser, Thomas Hubert, Yanis Antonoglu, and David Silver, who've, who have been super important um, contributors to this work. So um, here's the plan. Uh, I'll talk about AlphaGo first, just uh, to remind you um, how that worked and to establish some of the uh, terminology that I will need to develop um, the ideas uh, that build on that. Um, I'll then talk about AlphaZero, which um, generalized AlphaGo to more board games and used much less human knowledge in creating a very strong player, which was a very important step for us. And finally, I'll talk about our latest algorithm, Mu0, which uh, now is a single agent RL algorithm um, that can handle multi-agent games as well, um, but uh, where we extended the set of games also to include video games, and in particular, the 57 games in the Atari uh, benchmark. Um, and uh, the special thing about Mu0 is that it's uh, essentially a model-based reinforcement learning algorithm um, that um, does not even need to be provided with the rules of the game or the dynamics of the environment, but can learn that from data as well. Cool, uh, since we're so disconnected, Sege, can you just give a quick feedback? The sound is good, all of that is working? Yeah, all good. Wonderful, thank you very much. Cool, so um, yeah, let's start with AlphaGo, the first program to defeat a professional Go player. Um, you can also read about this work in our Nature paper from 2016, Mastering the Game of Go with Deep Neural Networks and Tree Search. So um, about the Game of Go, since we have a lot of uh, mathematicians, applied mathematicians, presumably on the call, I, I would assume that many of you have uh, experienced the game, have played the game, Mind you, it's a, a very old game, over 3,000 years old, China later refined in Japan. There's still a very active player community of over 40 million players worldwide. And of course, the game is very complex. Uh, there are more than 10 to the power of 170 different positions. Um, often people um, compare this to the number of atoms in the known universe. But the truth, of course, is that even if there was another universe for each atom in the known universe, the resulting number of atoms would still fall short of the number of positions of this highly combinatorial game. Um, so here's a visualization of the um, game tree complexity um, of, of Go. And just to characterize this in numbers, you can imagine that uh, it's a two-player game, so players take turns um, to um, surround as much territory as they can on the 19 by 19 board. 
And that means that at every move, there's roughly 200 moves available to choose from um, for, for a given player, which is much more than in uh, chess, for example. And also the games are very long because often they last for 200 uh, moves as well um, until the boundaries of the territory on the board have been determined by the players. And so we have both a very large fan out of the search tree as well as a, a great depth. And these were the problems that we needed to address uh, in the work on AlphaGo. Um, so the way we do that is by um, using machine learning uh, and specifically deep learning um, to cut down the complexity of the search tree. And uh, one of the neural networks that we use, we refer to as the policy network. The policy network takes a Go position visualized at the bottom here and uh, maps the position to a distribution over moves, as you can see visualized at the top. So uh, you can imagine this is a discrete distribution over at most 361 um, possible moves. And, um, and uh, the neural network uh, parametrizes that mapping from a given position to this uh, probability distribution over moves. Um, in terms of machine learning, we can think of training this neural network as a supervised learning problem because we can represent the position as a feature vector as input and uh, then uh, the neural network maps that to the probability distribution. And it can be trained by examples of pairs of positions and the move made, for example, by a professional player or by um, an artificial player. So that's the policy network and it'll help us cut down the width of the search tree. The other important ingredient is the value network. The value network also takes as input the go position um, but it delivers an evaluation of that position. So for our purpose here, the evaluation will be the probability that black will win. And so um, this corresponds to the intuition that players um, uh, develop about how good their position is. And if they want to compare two different outcomes and decide which is the better course of action, they would um, make this kind of value assessment. Again, you can think of the training as a supervised learning problem. The input again is a feature vector representing the position and the output in this case is a win-loss signal. Um, and you can think of something like logistic regression that, um, that would be able to learn this. Of course, we need a highly nonlinear mapping and use many layers uh, in a neural network um, to instantiate this mapping. Good, so we have policy and value network. How do we train them? Um, at this point, we were uh, very lucky to have game records of human experts. You know, people record games of Go, and there were hundreds of thousands of those records available. And um, we could harvest them and train our neural networks, in spe uh, specifically the policy network. So the way to think of this is we have all of these game records with all the moves recorded. We can sample a position from that. We can look at the move that was made by the expert player, and that means we have an input and a target value, and we can train the policy network to learn that mapping from positions um, to moves made by competent players. And in fact, the policy network already constitutes a decent Go player. When I first joined DeepMind, actually on my first day of work, um, that's how far the team had gotten. This was an intern uh, project by Chris Madison. And um, uh, they let me play against this first version of the program. And although I'm a decent amateur player, I in fact lost against this uh, supervised trained model. So not a weak, um, not a weak uh, player at all, but also not that strong. So the next step then is to employ reinforcement learning and specifically um, learning the values of positions. Once we have the policy network, we are now in a position to very far quickly generate more and more game records by having the policy network play against itself. Um, the policy network evaluates very quickly, so we could actually generate um, millions of positions um, just by self-play. Uh, and um, these games now, of which we will have many because we can automatically generate them, um, now give us pairs of positions and who wins the winning signal. And that's what we need to train the value network. 
um, because the for the value network, we want as input a position and as output the label if black or white wins. And so that's what we use to train the value network. And now we had a policy network and a trained value network, and we can now uh, use them within a tree search uh, in order to make the best possible moves at playtime. And just to illustrate this a little further, here's a, a, a cartoon of, uh, of the uh, search tree in, in the game of Go. And um, you can imagine that the policy network allows us to reduce the fan out because it tells us already among the say 200 different moves, which ones the promising ones are. And the search can hence focus on the ones that look promising. So it narrows down the search. Now the search is still very deep and that's where the value network comes in. Because as in traditional Monte Carlo tree search methods, you would have to go all the way to the end of the game and then determine who wins, black or white. The value network allows us to determine this much earlier in the game tree and hence cuts down on the need for a search as well. And this is in chess programs, this would be an empirical evaluation function that would be maybe hand designed with the help of experts. Um, but in, um, in our setting, of course, this is a learned function as I've explained previously. Now, um, we tested this uh, against humans, uh, first against Fan Hui, who was the European champion, but eventually in a highly dramatic match against uh, Isidol, a nine-down professional player and the winner of 18 world titles in the game of Go. Uh, some people compared him to the Roger Federer of, um, of Go. And that match took place in Seoul in uh, March 2016 and uh, was really one of the greatest adventures of my scientific uh, career um, because, you know, that was really when the... Um, rubber met the road and we needed to show that the program um, could do well against a top human player. And at that point, no program had ever defeated a human professional player. And I'd like to give you a little flavor of um, what the atmosphere um, looked like um, uh, with a little video trailer, um, because that I think best um, shows what was going on. Um, so you can imagine that um, uh, for, a, for a geek like myself, uh, have, seeing that kind of exposure of our work uh, was super exciting and, um, and, and quite an adventure. Um, I think I don't spoil too much when I uh, let you know that AlphaGo won the match four to one. Um, and it was in fact interesting to see the weak remaining weaknesses that allowed Isidol to, uh, to win that one um, game. Um, if you're interested in this, I would recommend to you to watch the AlphaGo documentary that you can find um, for free on YouTube. Um, it, it's really a fun and engaging documentary. Cool. Um, I would like to just share with you one little clip. Oops, sorry. 
uh, one little clip that shows um, one of the fam most famous moves being played in this uh, match, which is the famous move 37. Some people printed um, t-shirts with this move on them and, and mugs and so on. And uh, the interesting thing is that it was such an, an unusual move that our two commentators here at first thought that it might be a mistake. So uh, take a look at how they react um, uh, to the famous move uh, 37 here. So uh, they thought it was a mistake. And that uh, was very interesting to us because uh, what we found already in, in AlphaGo was that, um, that the uh, system um, played human-like to some degree, but also was able to transcend the human way of playing and play moves that would be very extraordinary in, in human Go terms. This particular move is a high shoulder move because it shoulders, it, it's on the shoulder of the white uh, stone there on the fourth line. And that is generally considered uh, not a good move because it gives, gives away too much territory to the, to the side that has the stone on the fourth line, in this case, white. Uh, but this particular situation um, warranted that move and later experts agreed that it was a very good move in this uh, situation. Good, um, let's uh, move on to alpha zero. So you can imagine that after the successful uh, um, application of AlphaGo um, to the game of Go, we were keen to generalize. And um, there were really two dimensions of generalization that we were keen on. One is, if this works for Go, can it work for other games? And we restricted ourselves uh, to two player zero sum board games, uh, specifically adding chess and uh, shogi, uh, Japanese chess to the mix here. Um, but we also wanted to remove some of the human knowledge that we had entered into the process through data and other architectural choices. And um, what I'm going to talk about is based on this nature paper from 2017 about AlphaGo Zero and the science paper from 2018 about um, Alpha Zero. So, um, one thing we wanted to achieve is to create a system that plays strongly without human data, solely by self-play reinforcement learning, essentially starting from random. We also wanted to avoid adding any human features. So in AlphaGo, we had still uh, human, um, human design in how we represented the board as a feature vector and added some features that we knew would be useful to the system for learning. And we wanted to get rid of that. Uh, and finally, we wanted to avoid any specific domain knowledge. So this needs to work for other games as well, not just uh, for the game of Go. So how does this work? Um, effectively, um, we again start with a very similar architecture where we have a policy network P and a value network V. And, um, these are initially randomly initialized and so lead to more or less random play. Um, and we let this system play against itself. You know, it's a capable system already because it has a tree search, but uh, the choices of moves it makes through P and how it evaluates positions through the value network V are random. And so it's very limited in what it can do. But we use it to generate um, a set of self-played uh, self games from which the system can now learn. And so the way it learns is uh, through the mechanism I've described before, it's essentially supervised learning. The new policy network P prime is trained to predict the moves of alpha zero. So of the system that just played against itself. We have games and those are sequences of positions and moves. And we can again train the policy network P prime now uh, with those moves that the system made as targets. And uh, the interesting thing to understand, of course, here is that initially those are very weak moves because they're driven by an almost randomly operating system. However, uh, the system can find some signal to take off as we'll uh, later see. 
Similarly, we train the value network V prime, the new value network to predict the winner of these matches. You know, through self-play, we've produced these matches now. We can sample positions from them. We can, we know the outcome of the game, black or white won. So we can train the value network. And this is in fact where the system takes off because even for a, a relatively random initial set of games, this system can now learn which types of positions are more promising for black and hence give an initial edge to the system. Um, and then, of course, we insert the new uh, policy network P prime and the new value network V prime back into the tree search architecture and generate new data. Now, since P prime and V prime has already been trained, they are more capable modules of this search and they can direct the search in promising directions. So the quality of the resulting games is already higher. And so we can now generate through self-play higher quality games that can serve um, as, uh, as the training ground for P and V at the next uh, generation of training. So how did this work? Of course, first we went back to the game of Go again, which we knew where we knew that this type of um, methodology uh, might be promising because our um, network architectures um, um, had already shown that they can work in principle on Go. And it was in fact the case um, that this Alpha Zero system starts beating the old Alpha Go system after about eight hours of training. Now, this of course depends a lot on the details of the architecture, but we had a highly scalable parallel implementation of this and that's why it uh, happened quite quickly. And then the system continued to train until eventually um, it started uh, winning against uh, AlphaGo almost all of the time with a 100 to zero uh, win um, observed win rate um, after 700 steps here. So the system takes off from random play, goes through the AlphaGo milestone and uh, becomes a considerably stronger system um, than AlphaGo. What's interesting here, of course, is why does it become stronger? I, I would argue in some sense because it's unshackled from human experience. So while the bias that we provide for AlphaGo through the data and through the architectural choices and features helps with its learning, it also limited the potential of the system because those additional constraints also limit where the system can go. And so this new system, uh, AlphaZero, didn't have that and therefore was able to explore the space of strategies um, in the game of Go freely. Now, um, what's interesting is that it did come up with some known uh, sequences. That's kind of reassuring. So here we have a timeline of what kinds of corner sequences uh, AlphaZero played. Uh, we refer to these as Joseki in the game of Go. And there are specific, often very traditional corner sequences that, that players have explored over uh, sometimes millennia and played and refined and that constitute um, domain knowledge, if you like, of how what good play in the corner looks like. And a lot of the sequences that you see here are in fact standard sequences that humans had discovered and that Alpha Zero discovered on its way to becoming stronger and stronger. Now, if we look at a particular sequence here, um, we can also look at when that first appeared in the play of Alpha Zero and when it disappeared again. And what we find is that, um, in fact, um, after about 30 hours uh, of play, the system discovers this sequence and starts playing it. Um, but it also abandons it again. At some point, it finds that it's not actually a good sequence to play and discards it in favor of other sequences. And uh, this has served as inspiration for the uh, professional Go community who have ad uh, adapted their own style of play in light of what um, Alpha Zero and other systems that have been developed after it discovered. And so we can really say that the system discovered new knowledge here that is now being uh, used by human professional players. Um, let's turn to computer chess. Um, not, not that many people know the game of Go, but of course uh, chess in particular in the West is, is a very um, well-studied domain uh, in the history of artificial intelligence. 
It's been studied by Babbage, Turing, Shannon, von Neumann, all the great minds, um, computer science uh, seem to have looked at it and it really is a testbed for artificial intelligence uh, research. Um, what had been successful um, up to that point had been very specialized systems. For example, Deep Blue, of course, famously defeated Kasparov uh, in 1997. Of course, now, uh, even in 2017, 18, when we did this work, um, the state of the art chess systems were already indisputably superhuman and uh, much stronger than uh, human players. So this wasn't really about uh, breaking through that superhuman mark, but the question if we could be competitive with this approach with state of the art systems that are highly specialized to the domain. We also looked at shogi, a Japanese chess, um, which is even more complex than Western chess. Uh, the large uh, board, of course, has an effect on the number of moves available. And also the action space is extra large because once you've captured an opponent piece, you can actually take it and put it into your own army and use it. And that uh, makes that action space much larger. And only very recently had, uh, um, had computer systems been able to reach human world level champion um, at uh, uh, champion level at the game of Shogi. Now, one thing to understand, of course, is that the engines up to that point had been um, basically search and uh, tree search engines based on alpha beta search with handcrafted evaluation functions that were often designed by, by grandmasters or with their input. And that there were tons of extensions and special cases that were uh, designed to make that search uh, most efficient and highly optimized. I'll give you a little uh, flavor of this here. Um, this is the anatomy of a world champion chess engine, I think Stockfish in this case. And these are all the different heuristics and tricks that were used to make that um, engine performant. It ranges from tricks in the board representation for efficient search, how the search itself in the tree is managed with iterative deepening, uh, principal variation search and many other things. They use transposition tables to save search time to look up states they've already encountered. Move ordering, in which order do they uh, go through the moves that they want to search. How they can be selective, effectively uh, heuristics that we capture with our uh, policy network, uh, tricks in the evaluation function and even endgame databases. Um, where um, chess positions with very few pieces on the board left have been exhaustively computed to find the best possible moves in them. So um, that was the state of the art and that's uh, what we were up against um, in, in Stockfish against which we did our evaluation. And you have to imagine that we replace all of that by our self-play reinforcement learning and self-play Monte Carlo search. Uh, so a lot more simplicity here uh, beauty, I would argue. Um, but of course, there's also the, de the devil in the detail in, in the self-play reinforcement learning. So, I mean, th th this is also based, of course, on a, on a long literature on how to do these things right. Uh, but much less uh, based on heuristics. Um, so, here's, uh, here are the learning curves for the three games, then chess, shogi, and go. Um, we'd already talked uh, about Go, um, where um, it surpassed AlphaGo and became, be, became much stronger in the game of chess. Um, it took about four hours of training until it surpassed Stockfish in its ability and then uh, settled uh, being stronger than Stockfish, uh, albeit not super dramatically stronger. And in order to understand that, it's important to know that at very high chess levels, most games end at draw as draws. And actually it's an exception that white would win and even rarer that black would win. And so um, that means that it's actually very hard to get an edge. Whereas in Go, there's always a winner. And that's why sometimes the margins in Go look a little stronger than they do in chess. Similarly, we also evaluated against Elmo, which is the Shogi uh, state of the art engine. And uh, the system was similarly successful there. Uh, we didn't really have strong Shogi players on the team. So it was much harder for us to appreciate uh, the beauty of play. So I'll, I'll stick with chess, but um, I'm sure there's a lot to be discovered for, uh, for the Shogi players 
um, in these games as well. And we published some of those game records uh, with the papers. Um, one thing that I found particularly interesting is that um, the system, uh, the Alpha Zero system, um, is quite different in its search profile from the uh, state-of-the-art chess engine. In this case, think of Stockfish again. You can imagine that a traditional chess engine searches millions of positions, maybe tens of millions of positions, depending on the time available for each move that it makes. That's how many nodes in the game tree it explores. And that number is lower for Alpha Zero by a factor of a thousand. So Alpha Zero visits many fewer nodes in the search tree, yet can extract play that is uh, competitive with or even stronger than state-of-the-art chess engines. So somehow these two neural networks are able to guide the search in such a way that um, it is more effective and needs to visit fewer nodes. And of course, a lot of the computation is then shifted into those neural networks. Um, what we need to keep in mind is that um, a human expert, a human grandmaster, probably only searches maybe hundreds of positions for every move that they make. And maybe also not even explicitly, but implicitly in some sense. So there's still a wide gap between alpha zero and how a human can handle this domain. But uh, what we uh, like to uh, enjoyed observing was that we moved the needle, so to speak, from going the brute force approach of state-of-the-art chess engines more towards the way uh, humans actually play the game. And this also showed uh, up in the style of play because um, people who played with Alpha Zero uh, said that the games were actually more human and much less like traditional chess engine games. Uh, in particular, Alpha Zero had a very dynamic way of trading off material and uh, dynamic features of the position. So it was willing to trade chess pieces for having its other pieces activated or for destroying the safety of the uh, opponent king. So I want to give uh, one example of, of this play uh, to you, which is my favorite position from among the Alpha Zero um, games. If you are a ch serious chess player, you might enjoy the book Game Changer, um, which um, details how, uh, how Alpha Zero plays and goes through many of its, um, its innovations. Um, here's a position that arose when Alpha Zero was white and Stockfish played black. And uh, people on YouTube call it the immortal Zugzwang game. Zugzwang, of course, is the German word for a situation where uh, one side needs to move, but moving is actually a disadvantage. There is a, they're forced to move because every move they would make is actually um, a disadvantage to them. And that's exactly the situation in which um, Stockfish with black finds itself here. Um, if you look through the position, there's a lot of pressure here on the F7 pawn. And so that means that black needs to maintain all, its, um, all the cover for this pawn, otherwise it will fall. The pawn is also pinned, of course, by the bishop on B3. And maybe uh, also notable that black's uh, queen is uh, in the corner and has almost no, uh, no moves available to it. And that, of course, is, uh, is a disaster for black. And if you go through the different pieces, you'll see that whichever one black moves, um, its uh, position will uh, quickly deteriorate after that. And in fact, what happens in this game is that uh, Black decides to sacrifice the queen and um, exchange it for the um, <clears throat> uh, for the rook um, on f6 just to get out of this position, and um, and then of course it goes downhill from there. Good. So that was a little excursion into uh, the type of play that we see with. Um, with uh, Alpha Zero, I'd also like to mention that there were two very interesting applications that we saw uh, that emerged from this work um, outside of the domain of games. Um, the first one um, you can read about in Segler et al. in Nature 2018 was about synthesizing um, small um, molecules, um, organic molecules. And uh, the connection here is that um, in that field, there are many little uh, steps of synthesis that people know can be done in the lab. 
And uh, one puzzle is that if you have a new target molecule, how can you devise a path for that synthesis that takes those known steps that you know how to do and chains them into a sequence uh, or rather into a, into a tree that, um, that allows you to, um, to produce the target. And uh, you can see how this maps to the search problem in alpha zero and um, how um, the value function might be something like how many more synthesis steps do I need to do in order to arrive at the target? And the policy network would capture something like what, what would be promising next synthesis steps from where I am in, in, in a given uh, synthesis in order to advance me towards the target structure. Um, similarly, there was another piece of work by Dalgard et al. in, uh, in Nature 2020, where they uh, have the target of uh, shifting a quantum system into a particular state. You see two qubits here uh, in the illustration on the bottom left. And in order to do that, they need to devise a, a sequence of, um, of pulses that they direct at the system. And to compose this sequence of pulses, they again use the alpha zero methodology um, in order to search the space of possible pulse sequences uh, and to drive the system close to the desired target state. Okay, so we finally arrived at the last step, um, mu zero planning with a learned model in which we still think about chess, shogi and go, but would also like to add um, video games and domains that are of that nature um, to uh, what the system can deal with. Um, you can read about it in our nature paper from 2020, uh, led by Julian Schrittwieser. So what's the motivation here? We would like to learn a model of the environment while learning to interact well with the environment, but only predict exactly what matters for planning, namely the policy, the value, and the reward. And so the goal here is to devise a system that doesn't predict anything that we don't actually need for planning. Let me show you how this works. We start again with our little cartoon of the go position, which is a state in a sequence of states of gameplay, but this could not now be any environment. And so the way we do this now is we first devise a parametrized ma mapping. You can think of it as a neural network, H, which takes the state that we're currently in and maps it to a latent state space that will be learned, that will represent internally uh, the state um, of the system. Now, once we're in this state space S, this latent state space, we can now have a function F that again predicts a policy, a policy distribution and the value of that particular state. But now it doesn't operate on the raw state, but it operates on the latent state into which we had uh, mapped the raw state. Now, in order to do a, a planning within a tree, and that could be regular tree search or Monte Carlo tree search, we need to uh, learn about the dynamics of the system or to represent the dynamics of the system. So this is done through a function G, which does two things. It takes the previous state here denoted SK minus one and the action taken at that time and maps to the new state that the system would arrive in and, what, and uh, predicts what kind of reward it would receive in that state. And uh, note that both SK and SK minus one live in this latent space that we're defined. You can think of it just as a high dimensional vector space. So now we have a way of mapping through the function h into that space from our raw observation, we can predict policy and uh, value, and we can roll that state forward by feeding in a real action and letting the system predict where it will end up next and what kind of reward it will see. And you can see that with these ingredients, we can now um, do Monte Carlo tree search because we can now expand the tree but it is not expanded in terms of the true underlying raw state, but in terms of the latent state that the system is constructing while it is learning. Now, what can we do with this? How do we train this? Well, once we have such a system, again, randomly initialized at the beginning, 
we can take a state and we can use the search and produce a distribution over actions, sample one of those actions and roll the actual system forward. In a video game that would be, you know, observe the state, map it, do the search, produce an action and then feed that action through the controller back to the game engine and roll it forward one step, which gives us a next state where again, we can use the Monte Carlo tree search in latent space to devise a good move and so on and so forth. That's really the only difference to the previous uh, setup in Alpha Zero that here, the search, the Monte Carlo tree search happens in this latent space that the uh, neural network needs to discover. But how do we update the system? So that's how we play and produce self-play games, if you like. How do we update? Well, we take a state uh, here depicted on the left and we map it into our latent state with the function h to s0 in this case. From there on, we now have neural networks to predict policy and value network. But we also have a neural network g that we can feed the action that was taken in that game and that then predicts the next latent state. And we can do that along what happens in the real game and produce these latent states and then update um, the relevant quantities of the neural networks towards their target net uh, values. For example, uh, we can update um, the state um, in, in light of P, V, and R, and we can uh, update the reward in light of the, the actual reward that we observe in the game. In Go, that's only at the end, but in uh, Atari games, there's also intermediate rewards, which the system can absorb, absorb and learn about. So these are the three components. A, the search within that latent space, B, the self-play that results in, have, in generating many sequences of actual play in interaction with the real environment, and then learning of the dynamics and of P and V and the reward um, through, um, through the architecture that I talked about. It's basically learning a Markov decision process based on the observations and then doing planning within that Markov decision process. So how did this work? Um, we talked about um, board games already. So the new thing really is to look at the Atari benchmarks. Um, um, just for you to recall, these are these old Atari games. Uh, there's now, I think, 57 in the standard benchmarks that include things like Breakout and you know little racing games and um, flying games and uh, platformers and all kinds of games. And what we show here is, um, the, the median and the mean um, in the top half of the table as compared to um, model three methods like R2D2, which was the previous um, the best system. And you can see that the number of environment frames that the system consumed is roughly comparable. Um, Mu0 even used a little less, also had less training time. Um, so it has good scalability and it surpasses R2D2 in terms of both the median and the mean across all of these 57 uh, games performance. And then at the bottom, you see a, a similar comparison uh, to a number of um, model free systems, but this time um, we use a version of Mu0, which we call Mu0 Reanalyze, which aims at data efficiency. If you now look at the column environment frames, you see here that instead of consuming 20 billion environment frames of these games, uh, it's now only using 200 million frames. You know, it's still big, but um, you know, it's also a considerable reduction. And um, this system uh, now does better than these other systems on in this uh, restricted set where it has access only to a limited number of interactions with the environment. And that's of course something we care about deeply because uh, if you ever want to train a system in the real world, it had better not take too many interactions with the environment because that might not be safe and it's usually very costly. So pushing down that number is always an important goal for us. And the way it does that in this case is um, by um, by reanalyzing um, the uh, trajectories it had previously uh, produced in light of its new network parameters. It reuses them and thereby 
can gain new insight out uh, from old experience that it had collected much earlier. It's like recalling old events and replaying them in your mind and now uh, drawing better lessons from them than, than you did at the time because you now already know more. Cool. Um, this works uh, for chess, shogi, Go, and Atari. I'd like to mention that it works for Go even a little bit better than Alpha Zero, which was a bit surprising. But of course, there's a lot of compute now happening in rolling forward the state. And we think there's some hidden um, computation going on that might enable the system to devote even more neural capacity to, to playing well. And you see that in the third column here where the um, blue line crosses even the alpha zero line um, um, and, and becomes a little bit better. Um, how does this scale? That's always an interesting question. You know, the system of course is trained with a fixed kind of planning horizon forward. We cannot do infinitely long um, trajectories, but it turns out that even though it's been trained with only a finite number of uh, steps into the future, it scales quite well with search time. So it even if you expand the tree more deeply than it was trained with, the system still scales very well. And you can see here on the y-axis, the ELO number, which is a measure of skill of the system in Go. And it goes considerably up from around 4,000 to uh, over 5,000 by scaling up search time. So the system, although it does this search internally, scales up for deeper searches. So somehow this stepwise prediction seems to hold up even if you roll forward deeper than the system has been trained with. Um, okay, uh, we have only 10 minutes left. I'll uh, just conclude at this point to leave some time for questions. Uh, just to recap, um, AlphaGo is already a powerful combination of neural networks and Monte Carlo tree search and uh, proved its case against uh, Isidol becoming a super strong Go specialist. With AlphaZero, we had a more general approach that could play now different board games, but specifically, it also doesn't relay, rely on human training data anymore and doesn't need any specific knowledge about architecture or the game. And then uh, the final step of generalization in this work was mu zero, where the system now doesn't even need knowledge of the rules of the game, but can learn that from interacting with the system and can, and can do so in a data efficient way that reuses past experience. Still many open problems, of course. What do we do with stochastic systems, like in a game like backgammon or the real world for that matter, you cannot always precisely predict what's going to happen. So that's a problem. Question in imperfect information games like poker, how could one devise mixed strategies rather than these deterministic strategies? It's an interesting question. What do we do in large combinatorial action spaces? For example, in the game of diplomacy, there are many more moves because there are so many different uh, troop types to be considered. And finally, of course, we're really keen on pursuing real world applications um, to see how this new, these powerful new neural guided searches uh, can help us um, address problems in the real world. Thank you very much.